So, uh, nice to see that there is, this room is almost as packed as the last time, last session. We could have used some concurrent room spacing there. It was absolutely full. People were sitting in the stairs, but, but uh, nearly as much here. Um, I will not talk that much. I will actually hand over to a, a great speaker, Jeremy Dean. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me here in Stockholm. Uh, you guys have a fantastic city. I spent Sunday walking around the whole city and seeing it. It was wonderful. Uh, it was like being at home, just with less snow. Uh, so I'm from Boston. Uh, we've got three feet of snow there. That's about up to here. It's high. And uh, I head up a team of software architects and engineers for a healthcare startup. And uh, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is how do we make software faster, right? How can we do things more efficiently? And that's some of the things we're going to touch on today. Uh, all of the examples that I have today are uh, this web application itself and all the examples is available on GitHub. Uh, my Twitter account there is the same as my GitHub account. So you can go off and clone the code and make fun of me all you want. So uh, what will we talk about today? We'll talk about why concurrent processing is hard. We'll use a demo web application I created using uh, Spring to walk through different concurrent techniques. We'll take a look at the Java concurrency uh, library. Uh, as well as some Akka actors. And finally, we'll do some magic around asynchronous web services. And uh, we'll probably not have time at the end for questions and feedback, but I will stay down here as long as necessary to talk to any of you, or we can go get some coffee afterwards. All right? So why is concurrent processing hard? Well, certainly, if you've been in the industry for more than 10 years and had to deal with threads and locks and strange-looking terms like semaphores, or countdown latches, you'd realize that um, there is a lot of difficulty in taking software and making it concurrent. But we as software engineers have an obligation to do that. You see, you know, about 10 years ago, the, uh, the hardware industry hit a rough patch. They could not make any of the CPUs or cores faster. So what they did was they started piling them on top of each other, two core, four core, eight core. Uh, and the software that used to run uh, really, from a single threaded perspective, or in using only one core or two core, work fine. But now, we as software engineers need to take our applications and bring them to the next level so they can take advantage of those multi-core environments. What you really want to be able to do is you want to see, see as you spin up the ratchet up the VM from two core to four core to eight core, you should see some type of improvement in terms of throughput. Now, I'm not talking about volume of requests. I'm talking about the individual transaction and how long it takes to get processed. So we're really talking about CPU processing time here. And I'll show some examples of that today. But why is it hard? Well, I mean, it's hard to actually think about how you're going to break down a task uh, or break down, uh, how, how you're going to break down data and process it in parallel. Uh, the other thing you have to worry about are deadlocks and starvation and race conditions, especially for things that need to be processed in order. And of course, testing can be incredibly difficult. In a nutshell, concurrent processing is fracking hard. It really is, but it's something that, uh, fortunately, there's been uh, a lot of emphasis put into the Java runtime and uh, the SDK. Uh, a lot of other libraries are out there to help us deal with this and make it much, much easier to deal with. So uh, what we'll do here is we'll take the orders web application. Uh, and so you're all going to come into the business with me, and we're going to be magic wholesalers. And we're going to receive orders of magic items from individual shops, okay? And we'll use this Spring MVC web application, uh, which has some RESTful web services, uses the concurrent library, and embeds the Akka runtime inside of it uh, and to test everything. But what we'll use is this, um, this batch example right here of, of orders. It's a simple uh, set of orders and line items in there. And we'll, every, with every single test, we'll actually submit the same batch. And we'll see how it's processed differently using different concurrent processing techniques. Now, please pay attention. This is all you need to get out of the presentation. If you get nothing else, you could get up and walk out right now, but I might tackle you at the door, so don't. Uh, but if nothing else, it's concurrent processing patterns that you want to look and know and use these within your software. So things like fire and forget, event-based architectures, things like setting up pipelines, workflow, 
using MapReduce, using ForkJoin, using Producer-Consumer. These are concurrent processing patterns. Concurrent processing patterns are not um, new, um, but they're also not exactly well documented. I mean, if you go and you find enterprise integration patterns site up there with, uh, hosted by Fowler, you know, you'll see tons of patterns up there or enterprise integration application patterns. There's tons of documentation out there. But concurrent patterns, no real central site right now quite yet. If there is one, please send it to me. So our first example here is almost an anti-pattern. Uh, it is a single request of that batch. Oh, one, one thing. Let me just show this real quickly. So here's our batch of orders here. Um, I, I made this like mega font size here so those in the back can see. And you can see that it's just a simple order from all these magicians from their shops, okay? And the, with every single order that gets submitted, so an individual order that gets processed, I had to come up with a way of mocking actual processing because I'm not really doing that in the web application. So what I did was for every order, I do a Fibonacci cal calculation, right? And so this way I'm not doing thread.sleep and we can actually see the CPU churning away with each order and we'll see that in the demos. But just know that all the examples use this little calculation right here to mock processing time, all right? So, with that, let's go back to our anti-pattern uh, example here. And what will happen here is when we submit this request, it comes in through the service, and lo and behold, we're using the same thread over and over again. Right? It's very single-threaded. So let's run this example. Okay? So if I go, come over here, and what I have here is uh, JMeter. I'm just using it, and I'm going to post that batch, or put that batch up into the web application, and it's going to run. All right? And what I have over here, is I'm tailing the Jetty log that's hosting that web application. All right, so let's run that. So single threaded example, we run it, and lo and behold, again, this is taking forever. Uh, this just ate up about 20 seconds of my presentation time. It's very annoying, but you can see it's using the same thread over and over again. Now, if you wind back the clock uh, to like JVM uh, four or five, you, you might not see this uh, distribution that you have uh, but the actual JVM is making some optimizations for me, and of course my operating system is making some optimizations for me. But it's certainly, uh, with this four core system, it's not using all four cores, right? It's only using two of the cores. So if I scale this up, it's not probably going to get any faster if I go to eight core, all right? So what do we do? Well, one thing we can do is look at the Java concurrency library, okay? Uh, and this really came out in 6, um, and I think it was 5, 6, and it was really improved in uh, 6 and 7. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement the fire and forget pattern in Java. Because I don't really need to return anything, right? So what I'll do is I will set up a new thread for each uh, order using a runnable. Okay? And what we'll see is a distribution across those threads. Okay, so this is pretty easy to implement. So. <laughs> We'll run it and just see what the difference is, and then I'll dive down into the code and show you what's going on. All right? So if I run this example here, and Java fire and forget, what we'll see is a nice distribution across all four cores, right? That's a thing of beauty. That deserves a hand, right? Yeah, exactly. Shameless. All right, so going on, to um, uh, let's take a look at what was going on there. Well, again, the single-threaded code, I was just running it per thing, but I want to look at the fire and forget example here. And so what I'm doing here is I'm looping through those orders, and for each one, I'm creating a runnable, okay? And then I'm executing them in a pool, all right? And this is a thread pool, and the way I'm defining this pool is up here, is I'm creating this pool right here, okay? All right? So um, this pool enables me to distribute those orders and execute them in a set of threads bounded, of course, um, so I don't run out of them. Any questions on this, Java Fire and Forget? So a pretty simple example. I, I'm pretty sure most people in this room have probably implemented something like this in the past. All right. So that's all well and good. Um, you know, obviously our, our boss at the Magic Wholesaler is very, very happy, but he's gotten some customer complaints because they really want to know how much 
each order is, the total order. So we, and we have to send that back to them. So what we're going to do here is we're going to fork out processing and then join back and return the whole order. Okay? So in this case, what we should see you know, in US dollars is the uh, 11,080 here. Okay? And so for each one, now I'm going to use a different interface. Okay? I'm going to set up all my orders. I'm going to implement an, in a callable, um, each implementing a callable, and then I'm going to send them to a thread pool to be executed. That thread pool will manage distributing those out into a number of threads, and I'll be able to get the total order. All right? So what we'll see here, though, when we execute this, is the same set of efficiency. Uh, so we have here is fork join. And again, the, all these tests are the same. So I'm going to run this test. You can look down there. And you can see that I got, again, a nice distribution across there. And at the very, very end, I get my total right up there in the bottom. OK? All right, so what did that code look like? Well, not much different. But in this case, I'm returning that total. And what am I doing in here? Uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating a list of callables. Okay, using the callable interface. And when you use this, you need to cast it to some type of type. Right? In this case, I'm casting it to a double because I'm going to return the total. I'm going to loop through these orders. Okay? And uh, for each one, I'm going to create the callable list using that. And then I'm going to pass it to this pool using the pool size. Okay? And then what I can do is execute it, get the future of that totals, and then loop through them and add them all up. Okay? So, uh, and then I shut down that pool and um, return the total batch. Okay? How am I getting that pool size? That's interesting. Is I actually got this from Venkat Subnarian, uh, who's uh, many of you may have read some of his books. Uh, one of them was actually on concurrency a couple of years ago. And one thing that um, he wrote was a little formula here for how do you create the number of cores. Uh, the most difficult part here is figuring out what your blocking coefficient is in terms of how long you're going to wait. So if a thread executes and there is no I.O. in any type of way, it's probably not going to help you. You're probably going to have four cores. You probably want three threads. But if there's any chance that the thread may block, you can add in that blocking coefficient. Say it's blocked 20% of the time or it's blocked 30% uh, of the time. And what that, this, this algorithm here can do is tell you how many cores you should have. And I've tested this in production, and it works really, really well in terms of going from two core to four core to eight core um, and having the right number of cores uh, in the thread pools based upon what's available to the, uh, to the JVM and, and, the run, and the OS that it's on. Any questions on that? Okay. Again, all this code is available on GitHub. You guys can download it. So that's an example right there of um, doing uh, fork and join. And if you also, if you notice, uh, if I go back here in this order right here, um, I've actually returned that value here to the magic shop, that order for the horse, uh, wholesaler. OK? All right. So now we're going to go move forward on to another example here, um, one that um, I've used in the past. Um, and I actually, believe it or not, I embedded ActiveMQ to do this, um, to create a producer-consumer. And the idea here is that what I can do is I can execute these over as they're ready, right? So in the call, you know, I set them all up, I, let it, I delegate it, and I let it work. Here what I can do is I can create a stream of events. And as each individual one is ready, I can just take the next one and apply pro processing logic to it. So this is true producer-consumer. Again, spreading the work across cores. And what you'll see here, as you look up here, and I, I pulled this out of the, uh, the output here to show you, what you'll see is that they'll be submitted, submitted, submitted. And then all of a sudden, I'll start taking the ones that are ready, and I'll be applying um, the processing to those. Okay? So you can see up here exactly how that's happening. I'm submitting, submitting um, order number 14, uh, line item number 1420, and um, things are getting consumed, then all of a sudden 1420 gets consumed because it's ready, and it's been picked off, and it's been, it's been processed. And ultimately, I can then still return the total order, right? Okay? 
So let's run this one and see what it looks like uh, from a cores perspective and how it allocates across my four, four cores on my laptop. So I'm going to run this. Um, and this one is the Java producer consumer. There we go. Example. All right. And let's run this. Okay. So you can see I submitted a whole bunch. They went pretty fast. And, and then they're being consumed. And you can see as they're being consumed, I'm outputting for each line item the um, price, the discount, um, and the, the, the subtotal for each order. And then we're totaling it at the end, and we get the uh, 11,080 in US dollars. OK? So we have that now. Now what we're going to do is take a look at that code. So how did, how did that work one work out? Well, what we used here, again, is we passed in that list of orders. And I created a new pool, again, using the pool size algorithm. And I created a completion service okay, with that pool. Okay? So I'm wrapping the pool in a completion service. And then what I'm doing is, for each of the orders, I'm creating a callable, like we did before. Okay? And uh, I'm submitting. You can see right here, I'm submitting the callable to that. Then, down here, what you can see is, as the orders are completed, I'm doing a take right, off that completion service. And for each one, I'm getting that subtotal, and I'm adding it up to get the batch total. And then, of course, I be a good citizen here and shut down. Now, this is not production code, obviously, but um, I shut it down, and I return the total. All right. So what you've seen is, is three patterns right away. I'm uh, sorry, two pa different uh, patterns, well, three actually, to uh, go from that single-threaded anti-pattern uh, of looping through these orders uh, and going to more of a fire and forget model, which is much better for batch processing. And then if I need to get back the total, going to fork join, and then finally showing you producer consumer, all using the Java concurrent library and all very, very easy to implement in your code, right? So that's, um, again, something that you can take away from this conference right now and use on Monday, hands down. Okay. So the next thing uh, that I wanted to talk about here is actors. And while John Franco is a director, renaissance man, um, has conquered the world, cured cancer, and done everything possible, uh, he's not the actor I want to talk about today. What I really want to talk about are actors, as in the architectural style of actors. And in this case, I'm going to be talking about Akka. How many people have heard about Akka or seen presentation on Akka? Great. So I won't spend an inordinate amount of time going through this, but for those that have not, I'm just going to review the basic concepts. So the idea here is that an actor is really a computational unit. Right? It, it's, it has a single purpose. It listens to a queue of messages, and as those messages come in, it processes them. Okay? And the actor itself, in this case, um, I'm, I'm calling what's called an untyped actor. Uh, Akka supports the ability to take your existing code and make it typed, uh, which I'll show you in a few minutes. An untyped actor just takes in uh, any type of object. So it gets in a message which is an object, and the actor has to be smart enough to know what kind of object it's receiving. Or you might have to do some type of instance of statements to figure out what that is. So it gets in that message. It runs in an actor system. And the wonderful thing about Akka and the actor, the actor system concept is the actor doesn't have to worry about failure. The actor will actually delegate to a supervisor for failure. Right? So you don't pollute your code with a bunch of exceptions handling. Like, oh, if this, this happens here, do this. If this happens here, do this. You just say, I, I can't do anything about it. I'm going to throw it back up to the sack, and the supervisor will handle it. Another great thing about the actor system is that I can do routing. I can do intelligent routing. Uh, based upon where I, I, what actor I want to process a particular message. So I can orchestrate a bunch of actors to do a workflow. Um, I can also, using software transactional memory, actually implement transactions on top of these. I'm not a big fan of transactions. I don't like them. I think they're evil. Uh, so I don't really talk about that in this presentation at all. So, and then finally, there's a dispatcher sort of runs the actor system itself. Okay? And actors can communicate to each other, right? Um, because they're all running in the same system. The other unique thing about an actors is actors are all identified by a URI, right? Universal Resource Indicator with uh, a scheme and a path. What's 
awesome about that, identifying actors by you or I, is that they can all be in this one actor system, which is a runtime. But I can take a couple actors and I can move them off into a separate runtime and they can communicate back and forth with each other um, using URLs instead of URIs. So you can shard out or orchestrate your actors across systems. Very, very powerful architectural style here, the actor system itself. So again, the typed actor is a little different. Okay? A typed actor is something that really ACA promoted. So if you have an existing method uh, and you actually want to make sure that the actor can process this particular type of domain object, what you can do is take an existing method and wrap it as an actor. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Okay? Another thing about actor systems is you can create hierarchies. Okay? Again, remember earlier on I said concurrent programming is hard because you have to think about task and data decomposition? Well, you have to think about the same thing. Remember, actors, actors should be single purpose, they should be doing one thing. Well, if your web application, say you're breaking up a monolithic web application that does 10 things, well, at minimum, you're probably going to have 10 actors, right? Because they're doing 10 different things. But odds are you might have more than 10 actors when you start breaking down that application. So it's a little bit harder um, to do this. So Akka, fantastic framework um, managed by the TypeSafe community. Uh, and you know, they, they also do the, the Play framework as well, the web application framework. Uh, but Akka itself uh, supports Scala and has a Java API, right? So if you work in an enterprise-ish company and you really want to use Scala, and this might be a great way to kind of break it into the jar file and nobody will know it's there. Uh, it, you can run it in standalone. It has its own microkernel. Uh, and when, when you go to the TypeSafe documentation, too, they really, really push this option. But um, I'm actually embedding it in a Spring application using a great library uh, that I found a couple years ago. Um, it is highly available, as I mentioned before, because you can access remote actors, so you can distribute out your actors. It's very fault tolerant um, because it comes with the idea of supervision and monitoring um, out of the box for you. And then, of course, um, if you absolutely have to, uh, you have a gun to your head, you can use the SDM to implement transactions. So let's take a look at an example here. We have Akka Actor Pipeline. So again, what I'm going to do is for each individual order, um, I'm going to take it and I'm going to hand it off to one actor to calculate the price of that line item. And then, I, and then it's going to pass it off to another actor to implement the discount. Okay? And what you'll see is, of course, each actor runs in its own thread pool. So I'm handing it off there. And what I'm getting is um, the orders, uh, the, the price calculation and the discount calculation, again, single purpose being processed in a different set of threads. All right? So let's, um, let's try this out. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to come in here, and we're going to use the Akka pipeline example. All right, and let's run this. So not as optimal as I would like. You can see it's using two cores and some of you know, the other two cores. This may just be the way that I'm configuring the ACA system and the individual actors. I might be able to tune this a little more so that it's spread out across the cores. But it was pretty fast. Um, and now I've kind of separated those two concerns. If I ever want to change the discount implementation, it's not really in the same code base anymore as the uh, implementation for the price. So I have a lot more extensibility there uh, in terms of how, how I handle and manage my code. I can also have two different developers working on two different pieces of code at the same time. That's also uh, really, really important, especially when you need to swarm on different projects. So let's take a look at the Akka pipeline. Before I do that, I'm actually going to show you the way I'm wiring this up. So I'm using a library that uh, supports the ability to embed Akka inside of Spring. Hence, uh, this is Spring configuration. Hence why you see the, the schema up here using Akka. And what I'm doing is using the uh, wiring here to, within the Spring container to wire up my actors. So in this case, I'm implementing a price actor. And with, when you're doing a typed actor, when you're taking an existing Java method and wrapping it in an actor, you have to implement an interface, and then you also have to have an implementation. And um, 
the benefit, of course, of using Spring here is now what I can do is I can inject the prices into that price actor, which is just a map inside of here, uh, the configuration file of items to prices. Likewise, with the discount actor is also a typed actor. And again, what I can do here is I can inj inject that, that, that dis level of discounts into that typed actor. Okay? So if we go back and look at the ACA pipeline, what am I doing here? I'm looping through the orders, as you can see right here. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually calling the method, right? So I'm not using tell or ask in the ACA system lingo or, or um, you know, send in this library, which wraps the tell or ask. Um, but what I'm actually doing is saying I'm, I'm calling that method call and I'm passing in that order. Now, there's several different ways of passing the context. One is you can inject it or you can pass it. In this case, what I'm doing is an example of just passing it. So when I come into the price type actor, um, what you'll see is it's receiving in the order uh, that's been updated with, and um, sorry, the price actor here, I'm getting the prices and I'm running the processing power uh, here. Here's where I'm mocking that um, processing time. Uh, and then what I'm doing down here is I'm sending it to the discount actor. Okay? Um, so I get a reference to it through the Spring container. And then again, I'm calling that method on there. So using the type actors, I really don't notice the difference that I'm necessarily using an actor other than the name itself. One thing about the actor I told you before, so I have my class, I have to extend typed actor and I have to implement that interface to wrap this into an actor. Okay, so one of the, one of the downsides is, is kind of, I wish it was just an interface personally. So then what I have here uh, is the discount. Again, same concept here. It's coming in and uh, it's going to get that processed order that's already been, uh, already have the price now, and then I'm going to look through the discounts, get the discount, calculate it, and then I'm going to build the, build, start building that total and send it out. Okay? So pretty straightforward with um, the idea of using these typed actors. Okay. So, Again, here's another example of what if I wanted to get the total, right? So in this case, um, what I can use is the fork join pattern. Um, this is not completely optimized because I'm still looping through the orders, but what I am doing for each order is I'm sending off and I'm getting the, um, the price and the discount. And again, what happens there is that the price and discount is executed in a separate um, thread and uh, I'm able to also get, go and get the total. Let's run this and take, take a look at what this uh, looks like. So I'm going to run here the ACA fork join process here. All right. So that's running. And you can see the different threads that are being used for um, the discount and the price. A little bit slower though, not, not as fast, but I am distributing the work off rather nicely. So let's take a look at what that code looks like, the fork join. So again, um, if you see here, I'm returning that, that, that price. And what I'm doing within here is I'm getting a future. Now when you get a future in the ACA system, you have to type it. And so in this case, I'm getting the future value of the discount for a particular item. I'm also um, going off and getting the subtotal future, which is calculating that price of that particular order. Okay? And then what I'm doing is I'm getting the discounted total of that order and price. And what I'm doing here is using a wait for one second, and I'm, then I'm doing the calculation here. So, and then uh, I, for each one, I'm adding up the total at the bottom. So when you start going down this road, um, this is where you know, there'd be dragons, right? Because now what I'm using is I'm using a future. And I'm kind of guesstimating that I think it's going to return in one second. This is where you need to add your failure in logic, right? You need to put, um, basically, if it doesn't come back within a circumstance, uh, certain set, then you want to delegate up to the supervisor. And the supervisor might want to do a retry 
Um, they might want to shut down the actor. They might want to send out an alert. Uh, they might want to send off the, the, the actual message to a log somewhere or to some of the storage to be processed separately. However, whatever you want to do, but you don't do it in the actor itself. Okay? You, you delegate that up. And, uh, but once you start doing these, using these features, what you're really doing is you're tying yourself and you're bounding yourself to that set of time. Um, think about things that, and we really want to look at the I.O. Like how, how long is, say, the, what's the SLA for this web service call that I'm making external to my system? Well, how long does it take to read, read and write to this disk? You know, you can do some tests using things like JMeter or Gatling. And there's, there's things out there you could hammer at uh, these different I.O. endpoints. And, and, and get a good idea of how long you'll be waiting. And then what you can do is use that in your code here to set the features appropriately. Um, other thing is if this was production code, those would probably be properties that I would be able to, be able to set externally. Or maybe it's a JMX bean that I can uh, change on the fly or something like that. So what, what I have here is, again, going through. And if I go back to the... Um, so, the fork, so this is using those two, same two actors that we used before. So I'm not going to show those again. All right. So let's go back to the presentation here. And um, I'm actually going to skip the MapReduce example. But it really is the same concept. Um, taking items and say I want to pivot the data. So I want to see a report of all the, all, the, all the quarters that were ordered, all the magic scarves that were ordered. Um, I can pivot the data and I can map it and then reduce it into a report and that's what you'd see up there. So you guys can look at that code later. But um, just in the interest of time, um, I don't want to actually execute this one, but I do want to show you these actors because one thing that uh, is important about these right here is how they're implemented. So if I go back to, I'm going to close uh, uh, most of these windows here. If I go back to the actors, the batch services, and I'll look at the map reduce, is I'm using, I'm doing send one way, okay? Which means um, I don't really need a response. Uh, and the map is an untyped actor. What does that mean? So the maps actor here is untyped, which means I'm building this really from scratch. I'm not actually taking uh, an existing class and wrapping it as an actor. And what you see is the onReceive method here, and it receives an object, okay? which means you really need to cast it or check the instance to make sure you're receiving the appropriate object. And um, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm getting that list of orders, okay? and I'm looping through, and I'm mocking the processing time. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is, once I've done the mapping, I'm going to then send it off to the reduced actor. And again, the reduced actor here is also an untyped actor, um, as you can see up here. And I get in that list, and then what I'm able to do is go in and, and do the calculations so that uh, we can get that nice little report there uh, for that batch. Okay. Uh, I'm going to close these for right now. And I'm actually going to go back to the Spring XML. And I'm just going to show you the difference. So if I scroll down a little bit, you'll see here's the untyped actor. And you can see I just need implementation. I don't, I don't need that interface. And, um, and I'm able to inject. So here's a different way. So before I passed the Spring context on, and it used it to look up the discount actor sent from the price actor, this is actually full. Uh, dependency injection, where I'm taking the map actor, and when I wire up my container, I'm actually implementing, my, um, injecting my reduce actor. Okay, and um, then if you look at the reduce actor here, again, same thing. It's an untyped actor. Okay. So what I've shown here is just a simple way of using really Akka actors to do the same thing that we were doing um, using the Java concurrency library. Right, albeit I will say with with Akka, I feel like uh, the code is easier to um, extend and shard or migrate uh, and replace. I also feel like the code itself um, is not so tightly coupled. Um, so you you have there there are some quite a few advantages of going Akka, and Akka really forces you to go down that task and 
and data decomposition route. You really got to think about how you're going to do it. Um, whereas in an existing web application, it's easy to kind of cheat on that. So let's go. Any questions on sort of Akka or Java Concurrency Library? If not, I'm going to keep going to our next, next example here. Come on, PowerPoint. This is the last year I'm using PowerPoint ever. Um, no, I'm serious. I've been using Prezi, and I've been converting everything to Prezi. So, so, um, so now we're going to talk about asynchronous web service magic. So what if all you have is a web application that really touches a bunch of legacy code? How many people are kind of have to do that, right? Wow, it's only a few of us, huh? It's not too many. That's a good sign. Um, but in general, you take uh, something like a mainframe application, like Kix, PL1 programs, and you don't want to touch them because you're a huge financial services firm, and you might want to put some web services in front of those. But those web services, guess what? They're slow. I actually have an example of a web service in my previous company that took seven seconds. That's an eternity, right? So what can we do? Well, we can apply some web service magic to it. So bear with me on this example here. And I've, we've used this uh, at my previous company uh, because of just that same problem. So the idea here is I don't really want to touch on the underlying code. I just want to work kind of within my controller, all right, and within the, within the edge of the web application, the REST interface. So what I'm going to do is on the original thread, I'm going to submit the batch. I'm going to take that batch, and I'm going to pass the whole batch off to a runnable. And immediately, um, what I'm going to return to the client is a future location of the completed resource, right? Using the location header and the HTTP response. And I'm going to return 202 I'm, I'm processing, okay? And um, the client is then going to be pulling on the bottom against that future URL, right? It's going to, and, and, and eventually, they'll get the 200, and they, they know that they've gotten back the actual response, which is the total, right? the 11,080. Okay. How am I going to do this? Well, one is I'm going to use um, caching. So I'm going to use EH cache here. EH cache is a great caching library. has natural integration with Spring. And so I'm actually going to set up that in-memory cache and um, that's actually where the bottom part is going to be hitting that cache and saying, is it done, is it done, is it done? And the top part running in a completely separate thread is going to be processing, processing, processing. Eventually, it's going to update. It's going to update that cache. And when the polling comes in, it's going to hit the cache, and it's going to say, yes, we're good to go. All right? So let's take a look at, let's run this example here. All right? So. We want to run the web service feature example here. And one thing I'm going to show you what I'm going to be doing down here, in here, is um, I'm going to be submitting that batch. This is JMeter. I'm going to grab that location header, um, which is right down here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through, and I'm going to do a get of that feature. Okay? And uh, until I get my response that I want, and then I'm going to view the result, and I'll get the result. So what we'll see here is it trying to hit and saying, is it done, is it done, is it done? Oh, it's done. Let me grab it, right? So this does rely upon your clients having to do a little more work. Um, but it might save you from touching some code that you um, are incredibly afraid to touch or you don't, are not allowed to touch um, if you are only responsible for the edge. So let's run this example and see what happens. So you can see right there, I put the batch. It's running in the background. You can see that I did a get against that. It wasn't there, okay? because it's still processing here. I do another get. It's still not ready, and I'm still processing down here. Oh, it's done processing. I do the get, and I should be retrieving that batch total there. And so if we look at the final get, that should be the one where it's actually uh, the, the polling actually returned the positive response. And if we scroll over here and we look at that response data, we should see, yep, the 11, see? All right, so that was pretty cool. Um, let's see how, how, how that's implemented inside the code. So inside of, and I've, again, we've used this in the patch past, 
Um, just re re real simple, this is all I'm doing configuring um, the EH cache itself to store this information. Now, the nice thing about EH cache is you can actually replicate um, across nodes bidirectionally, so you can do peer-to-peer -peer replication. So if something gets put into a bucket, it gets replicated to the other one bucket, and if something gets put over here, it's put over there. So it's, it stays consistent. I wouldn't recommend more than three nodes for that. It, it, um, it gets really chatty. At that point, you're looking for some other type of in-memory model uh, that the, the cluster of web applications can access and share. Okay. Uh, so we have here, uh, let's take a look at the code. Um, if I go into the controller, all right, what I'm doing, and this is the, bat, this is the actual um, put where I'm putting up the method, I'm coming in here and I'm creating a, a, a random ID here, uh, and that becomes the status key, right? And here is my cache, and I'm putting it into the cache, and I'm saying that I'm processing. Okay, that's the current status of this. Then uh, I'm going to create the batch, and I'm going to pass it off to the service, and it's going to go, and it's going to be processed. Okay, so now, now it's real good. And then in the response, I'm going to set the header, um, and this is obviously hard coded here, so you wouldn't do this, but um, I'm actually setting it and using that status key into the location header of the HTTP response. And then I'm saying accepted. Note, I'm not saying 200, right? I'm saying that I've accepted it. I'm still processing it. All right. So again, this is very restful. This is taking advantage of the HTTP headers as they were supposed to be uh, taken advantage of. All right. Now, um, the other method, uh, you can see right here, I'm just processing the batch. I'm not going to dive into this here, but note that it's processing, and we saw that processing before. Um, let's go to the get. So when I am the client, which, is, which in this case was implemented with JMeter, what I'm doing is um, I'm now doing a get request, and right here in the controller, I'm receiving that get request. I'm grabbing that status key off the URL, and I'm coming in here, and I'm seeing if the status is still processing using that key, right? And if it is still processing, then I pass back the same HTTP status code of accepted. If not, then what I do is I go grab the subtotal, and now what I do is I pass back OK. All right? So now what I've been able to do is, is be able to pa is not have to touch the back end code, but at the very, very edge, I was able to do this. And if it takes a couple minutes, that's OK, right? Nobody's going to be featuring a timeout here. I will say, you do probably got to think about the client side, how many times do you want to pull, right? Or how long do you want to pull? So uh, it's not exactly true. So let's take a look at one last example that we have today. And that's using some serious magic, which is uh, using a more of an asynchronous web service. So you were able to use this um, approach in uh, Servlet 3. Uh, there were some articles out there um, on some of the online magazines about how to use it. It was incredibly tough to use. The Spring Framework came along uh, and put a wrapper around it. It made it much easier to use. And the idea being here is, it, remember our web application where we had 10 functions? What if one of those functions is a really long running process and a very, uh, very, very greedy? with its thread. It's going to hold on to that. But I've got a whole bunch of nine other threads just doing table lookups or lookup values. And I really don't want to slow those down, right? I want to keep those going. So what this allows you to do is to actually put that thread that came in, that, that HTTP request, to, to sleep, right? And you put it off to the side. And then you can keep taking other requests. And then when it's done, it wakes up, and you can keep doing it, and you can keep processing it. Okay? That's why I said this is kind of magic here. I wouldn't recommend doing this for all your requests by default, because it's unnecessary overhead on your system to do this. You only need to do it for the ones that are going to be long running, you know, three, seven seconds, or longer. It still relies upon the client having a high timeout uh, on the HP client side. All right, so let's run this exa uh, example, and then we'll take a look at what, uh, what happens. So under the code, so what I have right here is a deferred, okay? So I'm going to submit the same batch, 
And I'm going to run this. I do some mock processing here just because it needs to demonstrate that you're actually waiting for a long time. So we're processing this. And at this point, that thread in Jetty has gone to sleep. Now that it's been updated, it wakes up, and it returns the order. And I get back that order right here. So the put order. And I get back the total right here. Okay, for that order. All right. So now let's take a look at what that looks like in code. So first thing you have to do, um, I don't know why they put this in here, but you got to make sure you turn async support to true. This does not mean that you're not supporting synchronous requests. It just means that you can support async to true when you're configuring Spring's wrapper around this servlet feature. All right. So just make sure you take a mental note of that. Inside the controller, what I'm doing is I'm receiving that batch in, and I'm creating a deferred result for that. And I'm submitting this batch result, uh, result uh, with the orders, and I'm returning that. Okay? This is what actually puts it to sleep. And when, once that object has been updated, then and only then, and, and the thread of execution of updating that object has completed, then and only then will the thread wake up and actually return that result. All right? So how does that work? Um, I have to extend batch deferred. Okay? And so I'm defending it. It's typed. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm returning the, the total there. And with that batch deferred, I process it in here. So I get in the batch deferred. I'm just reusing the aqua fork join method. Did some sleep for some drama. And then, um, then what I did was I updated that with the orders, um, setting the batch deferred total. Okay? And, 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 the, pro and the, the processing is actually complete. Okay? At this point, it wakes up and returns that response. Okay? So. So that's pretty cool, right? That's a great technique, especially if you have a high volume number of requests hitting that web server, and um, you don't want some greedy uh, process taking up that, that thread for too long. I have this up, um, again, on GitHub. Again, if you got anything out of this last 50 minutes here, is that you should be looking at your software and thinking about how you can use concurrent processing techniques. How do you use these concurrent processing patterns inside your code to make them more efficient, uh, extensible, and scalable. So at that, I have, uh, I think I'm three minutes. So I could probably take one or two questions, and then I will stay here afterwards. If people want to come down and talk to me, if we get booted, I can go downstairs, and we can talk over coffee as well. Any uh, questions? And I'll repeat the question if it's asked. No? It is almost coffee time. James. Um. Uh, testing. So James asked about, you know, how do you, you know, if, if you have one developer creating one thread pool over here and one developer creating another thread pool over here, and now all of a sudden you have multiple uh, things. Well, I would say it's kind of nice because I can grep through and I can see where all these thread pools are being created and I can do some testing. But um, I think that's really where monitoring comes of your JVMs, right? I mean, we have to not just think that the JVM is our little binky and security blanket, and we can just throw code in there and it's going to work, right? We have to work with our operations folks to make sure that we're monitoring um, and learning about the behavior of our web applications and what's normal behavior and what's abnormal behavior, and how many total threads is that, is that application using? What is the heap looking like? Um, again, there's some great talks out there on um, virtual machine memory management and thread management, and that really gets into how do you deal with the total. I was more looking at the, at the uh, individual uh, workflow or service that's being executed. Good question, though. Thank you. All right, you guys really need some coffee, I can tell. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Jeremy.